Good morning. Good morning. If you turn to turn your Bibles to John two verses one through eleven. John's Gospel chapter two, I'll read one to eleven as you follow in your Bibles. And the third day there was a marriage in Sana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage and when they lacked wine the mother of Jesus Jesus saith unto him they have no wine Jesus saying unto her woman what have I to do with thee mine hour is not yet come his mother saith unto the servants whatever he saith unto you do it and there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of which purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece, Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw some out of now, and bear it unto the governor of the feast. And they bore it, and when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water, he was made wine, that was made wine, and knew not from where it was, but the servants who drew the water knew the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him every man at the beginning doth set good wine and when men have well drunk then which is worse but thou hast kept the good wine until now the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory and his disciples believed in him May God bless him this important message to our hearts this morning. Now having given the words of testimony, he turns, beginning in chapter 2, to the works of Christ, because the deeds and the works of Christ also tell us that he is God. It's not just the testimony of other people, it's the testimony of Christ's life. His works, his personality, his divine knowledge, the deeds that he did, the miracles he performed, all of these tell us that Christ indeed was God in the human body. And so, John moves then in chapter 2 to tell us by the works of Christ, his deeds, that he is indeed his God. Now, in order to collaborate this thought, John gives eight different sign miracles. In his gospel, there are eight miracles that Christ performs. All of these eight miracles are different. Not two are, no two are alike. Christ healed many blind people. John only records one. Christ fed multitudes at least twice that we know about. John records only one. Christ may have done many of these things several times. John only records them once. He merely takes illustrations from the variety of miracles that Christ performed to show us that indeed Christ is God and he chooses eight miracles and we'll see them. The first one is water to wine in chapter 2. The second one is healing the nobleman's son in chapter 4. The third one is curing the, parap the, the paralytic in chapter 5. Then in chapter 6 there are two. And there are feeding the 5,000 and walking on the Sea of Galilee. Chapter 9 gives the sixth one, giving sight to the blind. Chapter 11 gives the seventh one, raising Lazarus. And the eighth one is in chapter 21, where Christ fished for the net, nets of the disciples. Eight different unique miracles showing his power over eight different aspects of nature. There's no duplication in these, and they all have the same purpose. You say, what is the purpose? What did Christ do these miracles? Why did Christ do these miracles? The answer is in chapter 2, verse 11. Right here in your own story that we read, this beginning of miracles, and it's the reason he did all of them, did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. That's why he did them. In order that men might believe, even as the disciples did in verse 11, Christ wanted to manifest his glory. What glory? The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He wanted to reveal his deity by his miracles. Glory means deity. Remember I told you in our message on glory some months ago that glory means all that God is. In all of his character, in all of his person, in all of his attributes, God means all that God is. And Jesus wanted to reveal by his miracles 
that he was God in control of nature, in control of all the forces of the universe, and so Christ did miracles to show he, his glory, and John really puts out eight of these miracles, guided by the Holy Spirit, to verify the glory of Christ. Now as we come to chapter 2, by the way, a little outline, we come to the real format part of the book. From chapter 2 to chapter 12 is the public ministry of Jesus to the Jews. Just those chapters, 2 through 12, private, private ministry with the disciples, the public ministry of Jesus, from chapter 13 to 17 there is no public ministry, it is all private ministry with the disciples. He calls out his disciples in chapters 2 to 12. He takes them aside in chapter 13 to 17 to get them ready because he's going to go away. Then in chapter 18 to 20, he leaves. So the book falls into three categories. Public ministry, his private ministry with his, uh, with his own, and then from 18 to 20, the final departure as he leaves. All right, so today we are beginning his public ministry. And we arrive at the first miracle that he never performed that he ever performed. His first public act to reveal his true glory. And I want you to notice four things in this text. The scene, the situation, the supply, and the significance. First of all, notice that the scene in verse one, and the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. Now what does the third day refer to? The third day basically refers to the fact that there were that there were three days between the time that Christ had called Philip and Nathaniel, which is just in the passages before, there were three days from the time he called Philip and Nathaniel until his marriage took place. Now Cana of Galilee was approximately 20 to 22 miles, and that's kind of as the crow flies, from the banks of the Jordan where everything in chapter 1 took place. So it took them a couple of days to get there. Two nights had intervened, Jesus and the six newly won disciples a journey from the banks of the Jordan where all of, his, where all of this had taken place in chapter 1. And they arrived in Cana in two days. Now Cana was a little village about eight or nine miles from Nazareth. Very near, in fact, some of the old writers say that you could see Cana on a clear day from the city of Nazareth. Only eight or nine miles away, just a little village outside Nazareth. Nazareth was a town where Christ had lived for 30 years. All of his family were there his sisters and brothers and relatives. So they arrived in Cana of Galilee and there was a wedding there. Now the second part of the verse tells us something more about the scene. It says, And the mother of Jesus was there. Of course this was Mary. Now it wasn't strange that she would be at this wedding place. As I said, this was kind of a, a suburb anyway. In a sense, and she perhaps knew these people. In fact, it may be that they were related. Some Bible scholars feel there's definite relationship here. A family relationship because you see Mary as a kind of assistant to the host to the whole thing. She's kind of in on the inside of what's going on and it could well have been that this was somebody a part of the family. Nevertheless, Mary was there and surely it was at least the friends of the family of Jesus if not some relative. Now this is very interesting that Christ would choose to do his first miracle right here. You see now what's happening, and I want you to get this because it's a very interesting thought. What's happening is Christ at this point is moving away from the, from the isolated family into public life. And as a point of contact between the 30 years of private life and isolation with his family in Nazareth and the years of public exposure as a point of contract, contact, he does his miracle, his first miracle, right at that initial point <coughs> where he's still got the family and yet he's opening up the public ministry and he does it right there near his hometown and yet he's already called his disciples and he's moving out so this miracle is almost a kind of point of contact it's almost a royal farewell to his family he does the miracles right there where they are in view of them and from there moves out his first miracle takes place in the family circle, kind of a point of contact between the obscurity of private life and the demands of the public life he has moved away. Now, as I said, Mary was likely an assistant to the host 
because she goes to Jesus when they ran out of wine. And we'll see in a moment one interesting thing that's really kind of not even in the verse, but just interesting to think about. It's the fact about where was Joseph. Well, after all this time of Christ in Jerusalem at the age of 12, we don't ever hear about Joseph again. Once Christ said, I must be about my father's business, Joseph was no more concerned. And I believe that Joseph had long ago died by the time you get to the marriage at Sena. And perhaps that is part of the reason that Jesus remained there until he was 30 because he probably had the ultimate responsibility for caring for the family. But I believe Joseph had died prior to this time and it must, it must have been sometime prior or perhaps John would have mentioned it here. It is also interesting that Joseph must have been dead by the death of Christ or Christ would have never have committed Mary to John. If Joseph was still alive, Christ wouldn't say, Now Mary, I'm going to commit you to John. Joseph would have said, Wait a minute, my wife, you're giving away. But Joseph wasn't around at the crucifixion. Evidently, he wasn't around at the marriage at Cana. You say, well, maybe he died during the ministry of Christ. No, if Joseph had died during the three-year ministry of Christ, that would have been a big thing. And Christ undoubtedly would have gone there with his disciples. And we would have read about it in the narrative. It appears that Joseph has long ago died, and Mary is alone. And she is at the wedding. Now, in Palestine, the wedding was a big thing. In fact, the biggest thing going on in those days was weddings. That was the number one occasion. It was, real, it was really when the man and the wife came together, and the union was the time when they, when they entertained practically the whole community. Now, a wedding feast normally would begin on a Wednesday, it would begin with a very, very luxurious feast. Following the feast, there would be the ceremony of the wedding itself, and there was also a ceremony, as even in the Old Testament, there was a ceremony. And, I, and I'll say more about that in a moment. But it began on Wednesday, and it lasted anywhere from two to seven days, depending upon how wealthy you were. Sometimes it went for two weeks. If you were really loaded, but most of the time, Weddings ran about a week, and you just said goodbye to your job. You dropped all of your worry about the crops. You went over to the house, and you had a great time for a week. In fact, the bride and the bridegroom would have been betrothed to each other long before this, but not come together to live. They didn't really come together and live until the wedding ceremony, and then, of course, all these people hung around for a couple of weeks. But anyway, they came together at the wedding ceremony. That was the occasion of the marriage itself. Now each night was a festival occasion and very often, night by night, they would dress the bride and the bridegroom in their bridal robes with a lot of people carrying a lot of torches. They would parade around them through town singing songs. It was a big occasion. They were treated like a king and queen and in life, and in a life where there was much poverty and much hard work and coarseness of, and coarseness of life, this was truly a refreshing festival of joy and a time which really was the supreme occasion of life in those days. And so, here at the wedding going on in Cana, now in verse 2 it says, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. Jesus and his disciples got an invitation to the marriage. You say, well, how could the disciples get an invitation to the marriage when they just got called three days before? They didn't have any airmail. They didn't have any letter carrier. I mean, they just have been walking from Jordan over there. How could they get an invitation? Well, undoubtedly what happened was this. Christ, of course, knew that he was going to Cana to perform this miracle. Obviously, he knew everything. And sometime on the journey, when they got to Nazareth, which would have been his home, someone probably extended an invitation to go on down to Cana because there was a marriage there and his mother was there. To just go down and participate. So Jesus, having been invited, along with the disciples, went down to the marriage of Cana. Now Christ's presence at the marriage is very important. By Christ going to this marriage and doing a miracle, now watch this, and doing a miracle to ensure the success of the marriage ceremony, Christ is sanctifying marriage and the ceremony itself. Marriage is a sacred union, and it is, mind you, it is a union. It is two becoming one in the sight of God. That's why God hates divorces like he, like he hates it. 
That's why God hates divorce. He hates it. It's a union. In fact, in Genesis chapter 5, when Adam and Eve were brought together to become one and marry, God referred to them together. As, listen to this, as Adam, not the Adams, but were one. They were one. Marriage has been designed by God. Marriage was blessed by Christ in, in, in attending it and ensuring the success of the ceremony. Now this leads me to say this. I'm constantly hearing today that in all of the marriage counseling that I get involved in, and the ceremony is, in, is immaterial, that if you just love somebody, go live with them. Now that's really the philosophy of our day. If you don't believe it, just check around on some of the attitudes of your young people. Fortunately, not all the young people at this church, but many young people in society, obviously they don't want to get married. Marriage is immaterial. If you love somebody, what's marriage? It's just a piece of paper. You hear this all the time. I heard a, a symposium on television the other night where a bunch of spaghetti brain people talking about the fact that marriage was immaterial. Well, I want to tell you that I can think of at least 15 good reasons why the ceremony is important perhaps most significant of which is that the Bible ceremony was always part of the marriage both Old Testament and New Testament here Christ sanctifies the marriage itself I feel that the reason people don't want to get involved in the ceremony is that they want to get out cheap so they figure if they can get in cheap they can also get out cheap I think another reason why people don't want a marriage ceremony is because they're not willing to publicly state their promise of faithfulness and the kind of people who want into marriage like that are usually the kind you couldn't, you couldn't trust. Listen, Jesus Christ himself sanctified the ceremony. It was a clear, honest testimony before God and the word of the intent of one man and one woman to live together with the promise of fidelity and godliness. And it was a statement that would, that the, it was a statement to the world that promised and there was nothing cheap about a marriage ceremony. Nothing cheap about it at all. And I'll tell you something else. It would be very dangerous, very dangerous to go into a union without a marriage ceremony because it would eliminate a tremendous motive and a tremendous restraint to make things work out if there's trouble. If you didn't have that ceremony and the certificate and that legalized condition before God and society, people were people would be getting out of it faster than they are now. So there could be nothing more. Uh, they, fi they filled them up. Now think about that. That's not an easy job. They didn't just take it under the faucet. There wasn't any faucet. They must have been, there must have been a spring or a well somewhere and a whole lot of servants had to go trace them through with whatever they used to carry it and fill up those water pots. And they got them, a, they got them all full to the brim and I don't know what those servants were thinking, but I can imagine. In verse 8, he said unto them, the servants, Christ said to the servants, draw some, draw some out now and bear it unto the governor of the feast. And they bore it. Perhaps as close as definition as we can give in English. Now the governor of the feast is the word Arachishnasins, the Greek and it means head waiter. That's perhaps the closest definition we can give it in English. And he was responsible for all the guests and the seating and all the food and making sure that everybody was well supplied with everything. And so they took it to him and let him know that they had wine. And so they just took it to him. In verse 9, he tastes it and he thinks, that's the greatest wine. Down in verse 10, that, that he's ever tasted. He tells the bridegroom, that's fabulous. Where, where, where has it been? You've been serving us the worst. You can imagine when Christ made it, it was good. I mean, it was good. So he brought him this. That's the miracle. The miracle was that the water became wine. And it's almost incidental. Like, look at verse 9. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, it just says it was. It doesn't say how it was. It, it just says it was. And he didn't know where it was from, 
the servants knew, he calls the bridegroom in and says, boy, this is terrific. Most people keep it to the last, till, till the first they gave the good wine and the, and the bad wine at the end. You've reversed it, and this is great. This is, this, that was the miracle that Christ turned water into wine. That was the miracle. He eliminated all the natural processes. Did you ever think about this miracle? Let's think about the miracle. Where does wine come from? Grapes. Where do grapes come from? Vines. Well, where do vines come from? Seeds and little vines. Yeah, well, where do the little seeds come from? Other vines. Well, where do all those other vines come from? Other seeds. Well, how do they grow? In the earth. What makes them grow? Water and sunlight. Not these. This wine didn't come from any grapes. They never were any grapes. You say wine has to come from grapes. Nope. No grapes here. I'm sure somebody thought, I wonder where such tasteful grapes were grown. There never were any grapes. No grapes, no vines, no other vines, no seeds, no dirt, no sun, no water, just wine. That, friends, is a miracle. Christ created wine out of what? Nothing. Nothing. He eliminated water, created wine. There never were any grapes. There never were any vines. There, were never any, there was no field. Nobody planted them. Nobody cultivated them. Nobody pressed them down. No, you see, that's a creative miracle, isn't it? Obviously, parallel to this, Remember the feeding of the 5,000 who caught the fish? Nobody. What ocean did they come from? They never swam. Did they have mother and father fish? Nope. What did they eat when they were growing? They never ate. Well, who cooked them? Nobody. They were already prepared. But what about the loaves? And, and who, in the, who in the field where the grain grew? Nobody had a field. There was no field. Well, no. Well, who planted the grain? There was no grain. Well, who harvested? Nobody harvested. There wasn't any grain. There wasn't any field. Well, who cooked the loaves? Nobody. Did nobody ever roll through the dough or cook the loaves? That's a creative miracle. Jesus made fish, made loaves. Do you know that when you're dealing with Jesus, you are dealing with the master creator of the world? And then some little pea brain comes along and says, Wow, it happened like this. Once there was a puddle and there was a one cell thing. Don't come to me with any of that. Any of that. I don't need evolution to explain the create the creative Christ. I don't need anything but a miracle like that. Christ made wine out of nothing. It's no problem for him to start with nothing and make a whole world full of everything. You uh, you have to just you have just a little creation right there in Cana. No grapes, no vines, no nothing. And you're probably a living illustration of the fact that he can make something out of nothing. And I mean that in the terms of 2 Corinthians 5.17 where it says, In any man be in Christ, he is. What? A new creation. And so I am. And so I am. Jesus is the master creator. He needs nothing. Well, the head waiter was really impressed in verse 9 and he didn't really know where it came from. But he was glad that he had kept it until the last. The thing that interests me is, what about the servants who see the little, you see the little parentheses, but the servants who drew the water knew. I wonder why, I wonder why that's included there, because when you go down to verse 12 and Jesus leaves the wedding, there's nobody with him. None of these servants, just his family and six disciples. Now, if these servants knew, how come they didn't pick up and follow Jesus Christ? I mean, if they knew this creation, this creative miracle had happened. It's interesting to think about, but nobody bothered to follow him from that wedding. How could they miss the Messiah? How could they see a miracle like that and not see who it was? Well, I don't know about that, but I ask myself the same question every time I preach the gospel. How, how can people hear who Jesus is and walk away from him? This is just the old story of Satan and God. And this world has been blinded the minds that believe or not. At least the glorious light of the gospel of Christ should shine unto them. I know, I don't, but I know there weren't 
there with Jesus. Le- they weren't there when Jesus left. The servants that saw it didn't matter. You also remember that a prophet is without honor, where in his own, they probably thought to themselves, "Oh, we can explain this away. This is only Jesus. He's been living here for thirty years. Such a miracle, and yet they didn't see it. They didn't see it. Amazing." But look vastly at the significance in verse 11, just very briefly. What was the significance of this miracle? In verse 11, the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. There's no significance of it. What was the result of the significance? His disciples did what believe on him. No miracles go without result. Or maybe the servants didn't go along with it. But I'll tell you, those disciples really got their faith driven into the ground, didn't they? They got rooted. They heard that he was the Messiah. Now they saw that, and Jesus showed them his glory. He let them see a little dazzling glimpse of who he was. He was building his disciples. That's what he did for them. A simple miracle for them. You see, even miracles don't bring people to Christ unless they're drawn already by the Father. Think about this. Are you a disciple already? You already love Christ. You, you've already, you're already one of His disciples. Then, if you already are, then if you already are, does does this miracle make Him mean more to you than He has before? It did to these disciples. It did to me. I trust that when you've seen the creating of Christ here, He means more to you than He did before. You got, you got here this before you got here. This, you believe in him more. Did your faith strengthen any? He supplies every need, doesn't he? And in closing, you say, well, I'm not a disciple. Where did you see him? For he is then. Did you see him as the Son of God? That's who he is. You just saw him operating right in those 11 verses. Did you see his glory? Did you catch the dazzle of his brilliance? He's the miracle worker. He's the one who creates without the aid of anything. And he's the one who turned water into wine and can turn your death into life. He can turn your sorrow into joy. He can turn your pain into peace. He can turn your sin into righteousness. He can turn your judgment into glorification. He can create in you a clean heart. He can make you new. He's the creator, Christ the miracle worker. If he's already wrought a miracle in your life, I hope by this miracle you see him to be more beautiful than ever you knew him before. And if he isn't wrought the miracle of creation of life of your in your life, I trust this morning you'll see him as the Savior and let him recreate you. And on that note, with our benediction, Pastor Jessica. A miracle is a great show of power that goes beyond the usual the usual laws of nature. God's miracles are wonderful signs of his power to make everything to make things right. I would like, I would like to read a passage from Acts two to twenty two. Men of men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man a created, a created by God, to you, to you by miracles, wonders, signs, which God, which God did among you, through Him, as you, as um, as you yourselves know. Amen. <clears throat>